Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. For almost a century, Farm Bureau has been a friend of the farm for all Virginians. Visit our website at vafb.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Here's what's coming up in this week's show. Spring fire season is bringing more worries for Virginia livestock producers. Gardeners are getting ready for the spring planting season. And the 2024 Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year is looking forward to the future. Home will always be Virginia, between the Blue Ridge and Chesapeake Bay. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from Graves Mountain Lodge in Madison County. People around here are especially appreciative of a rainy day. After a wildfire burned nearly 5,000 acres in Madison County last fall. And in Louisa County, two structures were burned, although no people or animals were injured. That's not always the case. And for those who raise livestock, it's critical to have a plan in place. Virginia's spring fire season lasts through April and each year it feels like there are more blazes to worry about. This video is from Sherman Showalter in Shenandoah County. He used liquid manure spreaders and filled them with water to soak the ground and trees. Farmers who raise livestock such as cattle need to designate an area where they can be taken in emergency. Having a plan to get them out, having a good place to load them out, having a, a trailer or a friend with a trailer that can haul them, um, and being able to get them out quickly. But before you move your animals, make sure they're properly tagged. If your livestock are ID'd properly, they will be brought back home. <laughs> if they are not, they might not be able to come back home. One benefit to raising cattle is they need lots of pasture, and that short green grass can help slow a fire down. Any fire needs something to burn, whereas if you got pasture laying out here, you know, you might not, in the Fall of the year, you might not have real green grass, but it makes it burn so much slower if it does get into the grass. So it's a whole lot easier to put out than when in the mountain you have all the underbrush. Graves knows that firsthand. Last fall, 4,900 acres caught fire in Madison County and his family's farm was damaged. He helped fight the fire, leading bulldozer teams along the back edge of his property so they could keep the fire from spreading. We had a lot of volunteer fire department and volunteers that are hunters, family members, friends that just came up to, you know, help um, right at first. In the Louisa fire, a community animal response team helped shelter companion pets and was prepared to care for farm animals if necessary. Many livestock farmers have an evacuation plan for their animals, but people with fewer livestock need to prepare as well. Hobby farms, you need to have a plan for what are you going to do, either when you're there and when you're not there, what's going to happen to those animals. Ideally, you have your own transportation. It'd be good if you have a trailer sufficient to pick up and haul all your animals out and get them away from the situation. Uh, if the earlier you can do that, the earlier you can evacuate and find a safe place, the better. Because at the last minute, roads are closed, as we saw with this fire, road shutdowns occur. Mel also says it's important to make sure first responders know where to look for a landowner's animals. One of the things we suggest, um, these are just called emergency tubes. Mm -hmm. This is a tiny one. It's one that I have for my uh, dog in my car. It's attached to my kennel in my car. Um, you can use just a big PVC piece of PVC pipe. Um, take these tubes, mount them to your fence on the driveway coming in. So emergency, clearly marked emergency. So emergency responders, firefighters can see that. And what these tubes contain is your emergency contact information, plus several other people in case they can't reach you so that you know that there's emergency at your house. It contains a list of the animals that are on your property and where they are. Mel also suggests microchipping animals so they can be accounted for. But if they aren't chipped and time is short, even writing a phone number with paint is better than nothing. Also, make sure your neighbors know your plan. 
they might be able to help if you're not at home when disaster strikes. With this wildfire we had here in Louisa, I have had such a community um, outreach and, and pouring out of resources. I mean, people have been very generous. I put out a call if anyone had a, a livestock trailer and a truck, if they could hook it up and be ready for my call, uh, make sure there's fuel in the vehicles and be ready to go, you know, because if we call and say we need help transporting animals, we mean right now. Uncontrolled fires are a fact of life for many Virginia livestock farmers, and those who have lived through them say preparation is the best way to keep animals out of harm's way. In Louisa County, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. More than 60% of Virginia's 700 or so wildfires each year occur in March and April. As the seasons change from winter to spring, there are often periods of high wind associated with weather fronts coming through the state. Temperatures rise above freezing, while at the same time there are plenty of dry leaves and underbrush. That's why the Department of Forestry bans all outdoor fires until after 4 p.m. from February 15th to April 30th. That includes campfires, trash bins, and any controlled burns. You can learn more about spring fire season online at the Virginia Department of Forestry's website, dof.virginia.gov. Hi, today we're going to be talking about successfully planting your summer crops from the ground up. Please stay tuned. Farming is a rewarding way of life, but it can also be full of challenges. If you or someone you know is struggling, call or text the AgriStress Helpline at 833-897-2473. It offers 24-7 access to professionals who can support someone in need and help find mental health services in your community. Please make the call because healthy farms depend on healthy farm families. That's 833-897-2474. Millions of tiny seedlings will be transplanted here in Virginia in the next several weeks. Spring planting season is here, and Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension has some tips on how to do it well from the ground up. Well, hello and welcome. Today we're at the Fauquier Education Farm. We're here with the Executive Director, Mr. Jim Hankins. Jim, it's starting to warm up. People are thinking about getting their summer crops out there. Um, what are some tips we might think about if you're getting ready to put your garden out? You know, we're going to go out there in that garden and work hard and sweat yep. and spend some money. The very first thing you ought to do is get a soil test. Don't waste your time and effort if you aren't improving that soil. It's so easy to talk to your local master gardeners get the soil test box and form and send that off to Virginia Tech. The Master Gardeners, your local extension office, will be happy to help you with that. It's, it's cheap, easy, and reliable. I agree, that's a, that's a great one. People should do that uh, fairly often to know what they're dealing with. Yes, yeah, and if, if last year you had a garden and you were disappointed with it, why not try to find out what it needed? and it's most likely nutrients in the soil that can be fixed really easily. Great tip, I love that. One of the next ones is, you know, not everybody has a greenhouse like this. So an awful lot of folks are buying seedlings. Where you're buying those seedlings matters a great deal. One of your best sources is going to be your local farmers and going to the farmer's market. It helps those local farmers because they are, you know, in those early market days, they are um, bringing the seedlings that they would be planting, that they will be planting in their garden. Okay. You know that you're going to get a variety that will work well locally and at the appropriate time. You know, there are a lot of garden centers that will sell tomatoes in February. And it's really not the right time to be putting out the tomato plants. So going to the local farmer's market as a good source for your, seed, for your seedlings. If you're planting seeds um, or seedlings, the soil temperature really matters. I say it all the time, there's a top secret source of information that's really, really important. 
if you turn that seed pack around and read on the back, it'll tell you when you should be planting it, how warm it should be, how many days to maturity, how big that plant is, proper spacing. Just going out willy-nilly sticking seeds in the ground, it's fun, but it isn't a great way to be successful. Read and follow directions. It's really that easy. Remember, this stuff really, really, really wants to grow. <laughs> so all we have to do is don't complicate it too much. You're right, some simple things here. I, I love the idea of trying to shop locally for your transplants. That means it's gonna be, probably be well adapted to your area. Yep. And I love the tip about the seed packet. Yep. It makes perfect sense, it's yep. all right there. And one last tip is whenever you're putting seedlings in the ground, they don't have roots well established. So you've got to pay attention to watering, really, you know, to get that garden started. You don't have to water that much once the season is going, but to get it started, a little extra water always helps. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Jim. Good tips. Love it. Well, for more information about starting your summer garden, contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from the Green Kitchen. Coming up on Heart of the Home, nut crusted fish. I hope you'll stay with us. Every spring and fall, Virginia farmers and other motorists nearly collide on rural roads. Sometimes these collisions can be dangerous or even fatal when a car traveling 55 miles an hour suddenly meets much slower moving farm equipment. The odds of a collision shoot up. Farm equipment operators are required to display a slow moving vehicle emblem when they're on a public road. When you see that, slow down. Give them plenty of space to do their job. This message brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation Safety Advisory Committee. A delicious Virginia fish dish is just the ticket for some tasty eating. Chef Tammy Brawley shares her own special fish fillet recipe from the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. I'm here today to show you a delicious recipe to do with fresh fish. I love doing this recipe. I do it for my clients all the time. We have got some delicious wild caught flounder, actually caught right here in Virginia Beach, that um, I purchased from my local fishmonger. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to take the fillets out of our packaging. Oh, these are beautiful. And we're going to take some nonstick spray onto an aluminum foil tray. Then we're gonna take our fillets and put them on the tray. Looks like I've got two really nice ones here. These happen to be skinless, but if you end up with fish fillets that do have skin on them, don't worry about it. You can take the skin off at the end of the cooking process. Um, but this happens to be skinless onto a nonstick sprayed aluminum foil tray. Now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna baste it with some Dijon mustard. Um, just a little hint here, or tip I should say, is you, don't want, you do not want to go into your jar of mustard and onto your filet because then you will cause cross contamination with the fish going back into the mustard. So what I like to do is put some in a bowl. And don't forget you can always come back for more. And then you're gonna take a nice little silicone brush or a butter knife, whatever's easiest for you. And you want to come to the fish filet and you just want to brush the mustard right on there. We happen to be using flounder, but this works really, really well with any white fish, to be quite honest. Um, I discovered this years ago, I ate at a, a restaurant and they put nuts on top of the fish. I was amazed at the flavor. So nuts on top of a fish filet work really, really well together. What nut? Well, it depends on you. What do you like? Um, I happen to use the nuts that I have in the freezer. This happens to be pecans we're going to use today. You can use walnuts. Um, I've actually done um, pumpkin seed before. I've done sunflower seed. Um, so it's really whatever nut you'd like to do. So we've got a nice little basting of mustard, Dijon mustard on our fish fillets. And now we're going to top them with some chopped pecans. What's a great way to use chopped pecans or how to do chopped pecans? We actually have a Ziploc bag here. I've put some halves in there. You have a rolling pin, something heavy. You can use a meat tenderizer as long as you use the smooth side, not the uh, pointy side. 
put them in a Ziploc bag, and you just want to bang them down. Now, I had already started some of the banging, and we're just going to get a nice little chop. It's okay if some of them are whole or bigger. That's not going to be a problem. But you do just kind of want to break them down a little bit. And now we're going to top our fillets with the nuts. And they're going to go into a 425 degree oven. Now, how long? Well, you know, it really does depend on the thickness of the fish. A Chilean sea bass is usually a good, you know, inch and a half to two inches thick. They're going to take a little longer to cook. These are nice thin flounder fillets. I'm going to say these will probably take actually less than um, 10 minutes. So we've got them nice and coated with some chopped pecans here. Again, any nut of your choice is great to use. I'm going to pop these into the oven for about 10 minutes. All right, so our fish has been in the oven for actually less than 10 minutes. And the reason for that is because the fillets were nice and thin. Other fillets might take longer, particularly like a sea bass or a halibut. Any of those are going to be thicker, and they're going to take longer. So we're going to pull the fish out of the oven. You know, one of the biggest things about cooking fish is that people do tend to overcook it. And I learned from working in a seafood restaurant years ago how to tell whether or not a piece of fish is done. And you really do want to use your fingertip. And you want to touch the thickest part of the fillet, which judging from these two, I'm going to say is right here. And you really, you want to push on it. It should still be soft, okay? You should barely feel that membrane break under your fingertip. What I learned about cooking it is take it off when you think it's not done. A um, couple reasons for that is that fish doesn't take as long as you think. And the other thing is that the residual heat is going to finish cooking the process. As you remember, what we've done here is we coated the top of the uh, filet with um, Dijon mustard, and then we crunched up some pecans. Again, whatever nut you choose to use is the best. I'm going to try to do this without it breaking. I'm not sure if I can or not. We're going to move it to a serving dish. Looks like it wants to break. That's all right. We'll still make it pretty. Um, I would love to turn this around too so you, you can see a beautiful white color there. The fish is definitely done. It was fillets, um, wild caught here in Virginia Beach, flounder fillets, and into the oven for less than 10 minutes. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Farm-raised fish are produced on 219 Virginia farms in 2022 and brought in $118 million to growers that year. Catfish, hybrid striped bass, tilapia, trout, shrimp, and even a few salmon farms are now based in the Old Dominion. Trout are raised in long concrete raceways in the mountains where fresh spring water helps them grow healthy and strong. Other fish are raised in shallow farm ponds or in cages in deeper water. Tilapia are often grown indoors in closed recirculating tanks that use filtered water. Other Virginia aquaculture products raised in containment include clams and oysters. Most crabs are still caught in open water. For our next story, we're headed to Heritage High School in Leesburg, where we'll meet one teacher whose agriculture-based lessons have earned her and her students some very high honors. Elijah Griles introduces us to Amy Goodyear. Without agriculture, we wouldn't be able to survive as a human race. I mean, it provides food, uh, plants, air, oxygen. Um, it really feeds right into the biology curriculum that we teach. Amy Goodyear is passionate about space, plant science, and giving her students the tools they need to thrive academically. For her dedication to incorporating agriculture themes in education, Goodyear was just named Virginia Agriculture in the Classroom 2024 Teacher of the Year. And it all started with just a seed of an idea. I was doing a project called Plant the Moon, where we plant and grow plants in uh, lunar regolith or lunar soil, if you will. And I was looking for some additional funding. Virginia Space Grant very generously covers the cost of the kit and the enrollment in the program. There's still a lot of supplies that the kids need to have, like buying soil and seeds and pots and watering systems. I found this grant through Virginia Agriculture in the classroom. And as I looked at their organization, I really fell in love with how 
broad agriculture can be considered. And I started using a lot of their lesson plans in my classroom, um, like the uh, strawberry DNA one we do every year. And uh, so I applied for the grant last year and this year, and they were very generous in awarding us grants to do Plant the Moon. We want them to be exposed to just the possibilities that may be out there. Um, that sometimes when kids get kind of locked into a classroom, they're not always thinking about, well, how does this apply outside of the class? Um, and so whether it's the Plant the Moon project or some of our other projects that are going on in other departments, that's what we want to see. We're going to have a permanent colony on the moon. And since we can't send all of Earth's soil to the moon, <laughs> we need to be able to grow plants and to support colonists living on the moon and eventually on Mars. That's where it came from. So all of my students are participating in this international competition because kids participate from around the world. And there's about a thousand teams right now participating. And they are, uh, will be judged by NASA scientists as far as their design, um, their experimental design, how well their plants grow, um, a number of factors. And then they will announce international winners and there will be state winners. She's always been looking for, well, beyond a textbook, beyond, um, beyond just sort of rote memorization, how do I really get my kids like involved? And so she's always searching for, um, for new ways to do that, new projects, new ways for them to apply their learning. For someone to um, also be willing to not only find those projects, but also to write grants and seek out the resources for those things, uh, that's, that's really impressive. I love to be an innovative teacher and to really link what they're learning in the classroom to what's going on in the real world. And I also love space science. That for me is just a passion. And so anytime I can get a little space science or aerospace into my classes, I do. <laughs> and this was one of the ways that I could bring in space science and agriculture and really make it more real for the students rather than just learning out of a textbook, taking notes, taking a test, move on. What excites her about, uh, about teaching the content that she does? Um, and then how does she make that available uh, for students? No matter who's walking in her room, she wants to make sure they're engaged and excited about science. I want them to know the concepts of biology, but more so, I want them to be able to read and write scientific articles to be able to analyze them for themselves. Because if I can give them that gift of how to find the knowledge, how to interpret the knowledge, there is nothing that my kids can't do. My students are able to produce and to come up with. They're writing papers and posters that could be in any international science competition and win, not just place or show, but they could win. And they do win with, with the Plant the Moon competition. I've had one team that won internationally one year, and the second year I had a team team that placed in the state of Virginia as a statewide winner. At this event, Goodyear and her peers learned that she earned yet another accolade. She is one of eight recipients of the 2024 National Agriculture in the Classroom Excellence in Teaching About Agriculture Award. So well deserved for, for her. She doesn't have that many years of teaching experience, but, uh, but the ones that she does, she puts forth all of her effort um, gives 100% all of the time for her students. I just really want to thank all the people that have supported me. I am a career switcher, so I've had other careers in the past, and I've had a lot of great support from my family, from my children. They always cheer me on, but even the students here at school, they really energize me. Finally, I want to thank the Virginia Agriculture in the Classroom for believing in me and for awarding me this award because it really... It means a lot, and I think it means a lot to the students. Goodyear received a cash award and a scholarship to attend the 2024 National AITC Conference this June in Salt Lake City. Reporting from Richmond, Virginia, I'm Elijah Griles. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we're proud to say that this is real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week.
Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Farmers and ranchers are no strangers to planting seeds and looking to the future. Some crops take just months to grow, while others take years to bear fruit. The same can be said for what we do here at Farm Bureau in Cultivating Leaders. The Young Farmers and Ranchers program engages young farmers and ranchers between the ages of 18 and 35. Through its conferences, competitive events, networking opportunities, and other activities, young farmers and ranchers become equipped and empowered to serve as leaders in Farm Bureau and in our communities. It's been a really good learning experience for us. I am so thankful to have these experiences and these opportunities. We have been involved with Farm Bureau for the last 12 years, and we have learned a lot and we have networked with people. Our operation has actually changed a whole bunch because of networking through Farm Bureau. YFNR has worked for more than 20 years to provide food to those in need around our country through our Harvest for All program. We've donated tens of millions of pounds of food and thousands of volunteer hours. These outreach efforts are helping to cultivate stronger, more resilient rural communities across our country. Farmers not only care about our land and our resources, but they also care about the people in our state and within our local communities. This is why this is such a priority for our people, and we really want to make sure that everybody has access to healthy, fresh food. Farm Bureau's strength depends on farmers and ranchers being fully engaged as volunteer leaders at the local, state, and national levels. We help young farmers and ranchers build the skills needed in a multitude of ways. The Young Farmers and Ranchers Program and the American Farm Bureau Federation has given us so many opportunities to prepare us, to help us be better public speakers, to help us network, to help us tell our story publicly and get more comfortable and confident with that. Competitive events provide an opportunity to recognize outstanding members. From our discussion meet to our achievement award and excellence in agriculture award, we challenge participants to engage, analyze, and get involved. The Farm Bureau YFNR program opens the door for lifelong involvement as a leader in agriculture. Get involved. Our Farm Bureau family is who we lean on. Just in this last week, we've had a member of our young farmers group pass away, and we have all leaned on each other. These people will become your family. These are your people that understand you. These are the people that are gonna rally behind you when something happens. So if you're standing on the outside and you're not sure, get involved, be there, show up to a meeting. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires.